Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time Evil, United Church of Christ, holds a ceremony of blessings and solidarity for Planned Parenthood, marching around the clinic and dropping rose petals to represent patients and staff helping carry out the murder of babies. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said this in Matthew 24:10. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. This falling away is not only true in that people would no longer believe in God, but the church itself would stop believing in God's word. As we surround this safe space this afternoon, we are compelled, friends. Trust women who go through these doors. Trust these women. We trust them to know that they are the one and only person who has agency over her own body. Yeah. And we will walk together around the clinic, dropping petals that represent our care and our holding and our prayer for all people who need abortions and for all, who, all of those who work with them. These times really call us to be prophetic, present, and, and uh, connected to the women who have to make these kinds of decisions. And, and we need to be in solidarity and show them how important it is that they hear that the people of faith are supportive of them and with them. Especially during this time when reproductive rights are under attack like we've never seen at any time in our history. I think about our colleagues um, and our patients in the state of Missouri. So to have you all here during this time is especially, especially meaningful to us. The honor and the respect and the joy were so present today. Um, we just, we couldn't be more grateful. People of God, we seek justice. We are praying people who are pro-choice. We accept the responsibility, claim the tradition, and we embrace the right to choose prayerfully with the knowledge that God is with us in all of our circumstances. When we are choosing to hold on to sin rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers as we read in Isaiah 115. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And pray for the day when health care providers, women and their families, can exercise their right to reproductive care and choice in security and peace. And we're so grateful. We're so grateful to you and to your work and to all the people across the country who are working so hard right now in this moment to make sure people are safe and protected and healed. Thank you. Thank you. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John fifteen eighteen through 20 If the world hates you, 
you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The news is full of the threat of war in the Middle East. At the same time, a revolution is underway in parts of the region, a Jesus revolution. An unprecedented number of Muslims are forsaking Islam and choosing to follow Christ, especially in Iran. Iranians are growing tired of the Ayatollahs and a nation led by the empty promises of their Islamic theocracy. An anonymous internal poll found that 80% now prefer a democratic government, and many are leaving Islam. You have a country with one of the highest drug addiction rates in the world. You have a country where corruption runs rampant. You have a country where more than half the people live below the poverty line. And the people of Iran are looking at this and they're saying, wait a minute, if this is what Islam has brought us in the last 45 years, we're not interested. We want to know what the other options are. According to Todd Nettleton of The Voice of the Martyrs, the faith option many are choosing is Jesus, with at least a million Muslims reportedly leaving Islam for Christianity. How's the regime reacting to this? We've heard 50,000 of 75,000 mosques have closed, and I'm sure they aren't accepting that very well. This is not something that is making the regime happy, and uh, really, in many ways, they are seeking to solidify their power and to crush any kind of dissent. And, and they certainly see the growth of the church. They certainly see Christian evangelism as a form of dissent. We have heard multiple stories this year of uh, a Bible study, a home church being raided. Everyone there is photographed. Everyone there is questioned. But then the leader of the meeting is held on to. They are arrested. They are detained. They're put in prison. Moreover, Nettleton contends family members and friends are more tolerant than the government about leaving Islam. They're kind of have the attitude of, hey, if, if you found something that works for you, if it's Jesus or if it's atheism or if it's whatever, if it works for you, I know Islam doesn't work. So I, I'm happy you found something that works. Well, I think it's what's happening there is actually representative of what's happening in, in the Islamic world. Don Schenk serves as executive director of the Tide Ministry. He explains how Muslims are experiencing dreams and visions, leading many to find purpose and a different understanding of God. The prophet Joel predicted an outpouring of dreams and visions, as we read in Joel 2, 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. This was confirmed by the Apostle Peter as we read in Acts 2, 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. We get responses from listeners who say, you know, now I, I understand that God loves me. I always thought that God wanted to punish me. And I think there's there's a, a an awakening, as I said, that, that's taking place across the Muslim world. Schenk states that Tide Ministry radio broadcasts are receiving positive responses in Afghanistan, where the Taliban pose great danger for those seeking information from secret Christians within the country. There's a lot of suspicion of, uh, okay, if I'm going to meet with these people and share that I'm now a believer, are they really true believers? Or are they um, just trying to identify me? It's more than simply being ostracized or disowned by your family. It is actually the threat of death. So accepting new life in Christ means accepting the possibility of your life ending in this world. Christianity is also spreading in Yemen, where the Joshua Project reports Christian growth is almost double the global average. Next door, Nettleton sees the Saudi Arabian monarchy becoming a bit more tolerant of Christians and their churches. Not necessarily welcoming it with open arms, obviously, 
Uh, but just the understanding that that it could happen, that there could be Christians here, and, and maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, that's such a change from what we would have seen 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. A move of God's spirit bringing change that may eventually transform not only Iran, but the entire Middle East. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth, as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world. But as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist, as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We have a disturbing update what might be next in the war in Ukraine. The U.S. and NATO say they have confirmed that troops from North Korea have started training with Russian forces. If the North Koreans join the fighting, it would be a dangerous escalation. It's a scene that has set alarm bells ringing from Washington to Kyiv. North Korean soldiers, around 3,000, reportedly on the ground in Russia, dressed as Russian military personnel. The images, not independently verified, apparently show the recruits at a training exercise near the far eastern Russian city of Vladivostok just four hours from the border with North Korea, according to a White House assessment. After completing training, these soldiers could travel to Western Russia and then engage in combat against the Ukrainian military. In June, when the autocratic leaders of Russia and North Korea, Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un, held these direct talks, they also signed a mutual defense pact, deepening ties that stretch back beyond the Cold War. Since then, South Korean intelligence officials have said North Korea has sold more than a million artillery rounds to the Kremlin, bringing in desperately needed foreign currency. While President Putin, in dire need of more arms and men, is attempting to contain domestic anger at the estimated 600,000 killed or wounded Russians fighting in Ukraine. The question that we're asking ourselves and we don't have an answer for it right now, is what does Kim Jong-un think he's getting out of this? And the fear is North Korea wants Russia to help modernize its outdated weapon systems, including its nuclear missiles. Nuclear missiles Kim just this month warned he would not, quote, hesitate to use. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Hezbollah is launching more rockets at Israel, while Israeli forces are hitting Beirut 
And Iran's president at an international summit in Russia warned Israel against a strong retaliation for Iran's massive missile strike on Israel back on October 1st. Ynet News reports the Iranian president said Israel might cause us some damage, but the response it will suffer and the scale of the damage inflicted will be unimaginable. And Israel's defense minister made clear his country is ready. The Times of Israel is reporting he told pilots and air crews at an Israeli Air Force base, quote, after we strike in Iran, everyone will understand what you did in the preparation and training process. All of that as Israel is keeping up its attacks against Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Chris Mitchell reports now. He's in Jerusalem. More than one year later, Israel is making significant strides to defeat the Hamas terrorists who committed the worst atrocity against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Since October 7th, a year ago, Israel has achieved most of its strategic objectives when it comes to Gaza, all with the idea of making sure that October 7th could never happen again. The IDF claims hundreds of Hamas terrorists in Gaza have surrendered in recent days. The military also released information claiming six Al Jazeera journalists are affiliated with Hamas. Up north, Hezbollah fired more than 130 rockets into Israel, while the IDF continues to pound Hezbollah targets throughout Lebanon. Retired General Amir Avivi, head of the Israel Defense Security Forum, tells CBN News Hezbollah is being defeated. The morale is very low. They are scared. They are running away. They occasionally, uh, they put some resistance, but much, much lower than anything we, we expected. Uh, so overall, if we continue to attack systematically, uh, there is a chance that we'll see this organization uh, militarily dismantled. Amir believes this might be the time the Lebanese could reclaim their country. We are hoping that uh, in Lebanon, the Lebanese people and the different groups in Lebanon, the Sunnis, the Christians, the Maroonis, the Jews, will seize the moment and really get rid of uh, Hezbollah. Lebanese member of parliament Nadim Gamayel, a Christian, blames Hezbollah for Lebanon's woes. They got themselves into this crisis, and they need to bear the responsibility. They should not think, not even for a second, to come to us and ask us to bear the responsibility. We will not solve the crisis for Hezbollah. In order to solve its crisis today, Hezbollah needs to hand over its weapons. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria, will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Police in Washington say that a 15-year-old boy is a suspect in the killing of a couple and three of their children. Members of the community gathered last night for a vigil to honor the victims. Several neighbors called 911 early Monday morning, reporting gunfire coming from a home where a family of seven lived. When deputies arrived, they found five people dead, two adults and three children. A sixth victim, an 11-year-old girl, was hurt. She's now being treated at a local hospital. Just in total shock, I keep bursting into tears. Police arrested the suspect, a 15-year-old who lived at the home without incident. Authorities did not initially release the victim's names, but at a vigil Tuesday, friends of the family said the parents are Mark and Sarah Humiston. Raya Robertson was the soccer coach for one of the children, a 9-year-old. He scored three goals on Saturday, and he's just a really bright light. 
all of all of the kids and family were really. Throughout the day today, people came by this church to create these luminaries. One woman told me it was a way of feeling like you were doing something, anything to help. That question, why? Why did this happen? Why? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. And there is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question, why do bad things happen to good people, is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him, if not directly caused by Him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine, as we read in Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job 121, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 13.15 Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job didn't understand why God had allowed the things he did, but he knew God was good and therefore continued to trust in him. That should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64.6. 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, 
as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand his reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135.3 Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.